Jerry Joe Fayogan, and I'm the Dean of Library Services. And as librarians tend to do, every morning I look at the news. I, I get on the internet, uh, I look at newspapers to see what's happening in the world. And it just so happened that today I found an article that I thought was very timely. It's entitled, Man Set Says He Wasn't Cooking Meth Inside Walmart. This is the man. <coughs> It says, his name is Armstrong, he tried to flee when Coopers approached him in a restaurant restroom and a fight ensued, lasting up to eight minutes. The affidavit, affidavit says that as he struggled, as they struggled to handcuff the suspect, he was found to have a knife in his pocket. He's in jail. It reminded me of another article that I read, I believe it was in August, which said, Ohio Walmart, where cops shot black men for the full pellet selling some shelf. I'm a mother. I have two African American sons. And my question is, what's the difference? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sorry for the uh, short disruption, but uh, one thing that you're going to learn, and I'm an old man and it took me some time to learn it, <coughs> is that you must be flexible. And when the conditions require flexibility, you got to be flexible. So we're here today to talk about one of the most important topics that can be discussed on college campuses across this country. My name is Otis Johnson, and I have the honor of being a scholar in residence here at Savannah State, located in the Asa H. Gordon Library. And every semester, uh, we have uh, either a lecture or a dialogue about a topic of importance uh, to young people. And I can't think of another topic more timely than this that we're going to discuss today. We have assembled a panel, and I want to tell you right now that we didn't exclude women, but because most of the victims that we are going to be talking about are African American men, I wanted to have uh, a panel uh, of people who can talk about this both from uh, a scholarly uh, perspective from a practitioner perspective, from a political perspective, and we have a young man who is a student here and a leader on this campus, on this panel. Brandon Hall, and let me go, and, and it's interesting how they naturally sat in alphabetical order. <laughs> we have Captain Larry Branson, who is with the Savannah Chatham um, Metropolitan Police Department. We have Brandon Hall, who is a student here, and a leader in the Collegiate 100 Black Men. We have Van Johnson, who is the mayor pro tem of the city of Savannah on the city council. We have Dr. Larry Stewart, who is a faculty member here in criminal justice. <coughs> and we have Dr. <coughs> Larry Stokes, who is a faculty member in uh, uh, behavioral science. I want to quickly set the context for this uh, because I always believe that we ought to deal with things in context. This is the negative picture of the relationship between the black community and the food. The black community sees themselves, many in the black community, and a growing number because of what's happening across the country now, see themselves as victims of oppression. Law enforcement is seen as agents of that oppression. Now we're not talking about arguing over is this valid or not. These are perceptions that we have to deal with because 
the reactions that you are seeing is primarily driven by experience and perception. And therefore, this leads to social contract, social conflict and distrust. But what, where we want to go, is to a poverty picture. <coughs> Because 
he's going to tell us what the Savannah Chatham Metropolitan Police is doing uh, around the area of police, commu uh, police community relations and how uh, we can work together uh, to get to that positive relationship between the community and the owner. So will that work? All right, we're ready to roll. All right. So, first off, good afternoon, everyone. Please stand up so, so the people in the back can hear you. Everybody can see me here. All right, cool. Well, first off, I have to say, as far as my age, well, our age group, let's, let's be honest with ourselves. We have all been taught since we were young that because of our skin color, well, the, the majority of us, that because of our skin color, that we are going to be targeted naturally, whether it is on purpose or by accident, that we are naturally targeted. Can we all agree on that? Now, the way I see it is that even though we can't, we are naturally targeted, first, we shouldn't. Let's get that part straight now. Get that out right now. We should not be naturally targeted. Second, there should be, I should be there, I believe there should be more training on how certain, on how certain situations should be handled. There is no reason why members of the African American community should be getting shot, killed, harassed over very, very minuscule, uh, over breaking very minuscule laws. I, I can even speak from my own, from my own experience. Now, true enough, there was one night I was in a, in a suit just like this, but I am, I am young. There are certain things I like to do. I like to, I like to go out, I like to have fun, and, when I, and honestly, when I ride around in my car, I actually like to have the music and the bass all turned all the way up. <laughs> <laughs> but, despite what I had on, I was stopped. And look, I'm not gonna lie, like, that is an actual charge. You can't be pulled over for having your, you can't be, have, you can't be pulled over for having your music turned on. But the way I was treated, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't apprehended, I wasn't given the ticket. Oh, I can say that. Yeah. Okay, great. stopped me. I was completely amicable. I made, I made every, I, I took every action I knew possible so that I know that everything could go smooth as possible. Although, I was a victim of a mistake and I didn't. I was harassed, questioned about where I was, and then released. I had a friend with me. He, he saw everything. I was I was spoken to harshly, I was called outside of my name. And when I when I talked to him about it, at first I was a little bit distressed. I, I could have been no older than 18. But then he said that's how things are. Now, by a show of hands, who who can say they honestly disagree with me? By the way, I was treated. <laughs> And it's crazy how, how things like that can happen. Now, I, there have been times where I was stopped and harassed. I remember I went through a checkpoint. I, I just come from the gym. I was in gym shorts and a hoodie. I was still put through extra harassment. I saw the other cars going through the checkpoint. Like it was nothing, like there was nothing wrong. I pulled up, had nothing on me, everything was fine. My music was off. <laughs> and yet I was still brought through the ringer. They still wanted to search my vehicle. They still wanted to do everything. And I could do it. Because I, I had nothing to hide. Now, 
my question is, why is it that someone like me, I don't have any criminal agendas. I don't have anything against the police. I was raised, I was raised that, to believe that the police actually are, are here to help us, despite popular belief. But if, if you act a certain kind of way, they'll, they'll have no problem. There's no real issue with them turning things around. So why is it that we are subject to so much but and but our reaction to it is like this is the status quo. Why is violence in meeting in meeting situations? I'm not saying in every situation. But why is violence or anger expected? And honestly, that's a question that's been going through my mind many, many times ever since uh, Dr. Johnson asked me to do the channel. Because I know, uh, as far as I'm concerned, me and, like, I don't have any, re I should have no problems with police. I should. I, don't, I have no criminal record. Uh, I, don't, I don't even have a misdemeanor on my record. Like but, yeah, on many occasions when I've been pulled over, I've been so much adversity, it's just, just like, why? And I, should, and I can understand if I was, I, you know, I'm not even going to say I can understand. Because at first I was going to say I can understand if I was in a hoodie and some gym shorts and all that, but that shouldn't matter. It shouldn't. At the end of the day, we're human beings just like everyone else. But why is it that I can run into things like this, even dressed in a suit? Even dressed... I could be in a collar shirt button all the way to the top, <laughs> shirt tucked in and everything, and I could still run into the person. And to be honest, I, don't, I, I honestly don't think I look all that intimidating. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not about to rob it. <laughs> like, that's, that's not <laughs> Good afternoon. Good Always kind of a pleasure to be at my alma mater, Savannah State. I knew this college where you can get anywhere from here. And served at this place means a lot to me and being asked by my mentor. Dr. Otis Johnson, which I had the pleasure of serving, and he was a 65th mayor, a 64th mayor, uh, while I was in the great city, so I was elated to have the opportunity to come. Uh, my experience is a little bit different. I'm kind of conflicted because I've served in those capacities. I remember that I wanted to be a police officer. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and we had these situations where the police would just come and make us put our faces in the street. We're laying in the street for minutes, and they really know why we were laying there. And then after it's okay, thank you very much. That was it. Why are you making sense? Don't worry about it. You know, we just got a report that, you know, there were some black guys. And when you talk about the, the, the average black guy, when you talk about 5'10", medium build, short to no hair, that's me. <laughs> and that's a whole lot. And when I got into, uh, graduated from Savannah State and uh, did some work for a while, decided that was the only way to infiltrate and change the situation was to become in that situation, in which I became a, a Chatham County police officer, uh, became a law enforcement instructor, and since that time, uh, with the Chatham County Sheriff's Department, where I've been now uh, 20 years in the military office. Um, and our realities are real, and I see it from both sides. And now being in a policy position, uh, when we have a 600-member police force um, in a city that is majority African-American, how do we deal with those types of situations? I know for me, I wanted to be able to go home at the end of my shift. That was it for me. I wanted to go home. And you did not know what you were going to run up into. And to my young brother here, guys look like you rob stores and they carry guns too. And I mean, they dress in your kind of way. Matter of fact, my hometown, just this uh, past week, there was four girls beat down a girl and they, and they, next to my high school. Girls. 
Um, you know, so I guess the problem is you can't take what looks. We've stopped people on drug drug interdiction on I-95, little old ladies driving in a station wagon. They got drugs all in the tires. Up. So I mean, the police officer, you know, you, you can't you can't deal with that. Um, but we have to be able to to really find and master the balance between being a nuisance and being a help. Um, that's I think our role is to be able to to, to balance that. And I'm really not sure of how we do it. I, I believe we do it through training. Um, prior to, to the 1980s, they used to train officers mostly on firearms. <laughs> uh, from the 80s up to recently, we trained them on ethics. But it's really more about now cultural sensitivity. Oftentimes, because we don't understand people. When you look even at our school system, um, little black boys are um, suspended and failed from school at much, much greater rates. And I think the reason is because they don't understand it. Um, you know, you have young men that are naturally aggressive. That's how what they do. That's how we do. And sometimes we just don't know how to deal with it. Um, since Mayor Johnson mentioned Augusta Avenue, I, I will talk about that a little bit. Um, and I know our active commission will talk about community. And community policing is a misnomer, um, from my experience. Uh, people think, oh, that's, that's the panacea, and it's really not. There's no program such as community policing. It's really the way by which you go about doing that which you do. Really, police, policing, proper policing in its essence is community policing. It's getting engaged, getting involved, knowing the people that you're serving, um, having a dialogue all the time with the people that you're serving, um, understanding who they are, the things that are important to them, and how you engage them on a way that when things are happening, they're coming to you. It amazes me, and I'll say this, that we can have a shooting in here right now Mm -hmm. I shoot Dr. Johnson. And everybody's sitting in here. Police come in here and say, who shot him? Everybody, I don't know. I ain't seen nothing. <laughs> Y'all know, I ain't seen nothing. <laughs> so what ends up happening is, now you have a shooter who's gotten away with it, who now has a propensity to shoot someone else because I got away with it the first time. And even if you look at our statistics in, in Savannah, uh, most of our crime is committed by a very, very small part of the population. These are people who got away with it before because people didn't want to say it. So um, Augusta Avenue, it was, uh, I was in September? Yes, September. All right. We were in city council having our workshop. And as Dr. Johnson knows, a wonderful morning experience, a wonderful way to spend your morning. And I got a call, and then all of a sudden my Facebook and Twitter blowing the black man shot. Uh, Augusta Avenue, hang on. Um, and it's going down. People, it's going down. And I'm like, okay. So I told the man, I need to go out here and see what's going on. No, don't go, don't go. Well, um, well, we'll send an officer. I don't need an officer to go with me. I mean, if I'm going to be afraid of my folks, who's going to be afraid of me now? When I got out there, it, was, it amazed me. In the middle of the day, we're talking about now 1130 in the day, um, how many young African American people would just like walk around with flip flops just chilling like it was a Saturday? Um, and it was a very, very hostile, hostile crime. Um, and you see the body of this young man laying here um, that, that now they're just beginning to cover up that people knew. Um, and people were very, very upset. And I think for them, it really just re-engaged all of the ne negative stereotypes. I remember when I was wearing a uniform, I would be at Walmart or something. They say, if you be bad, that police officer's gonna put you in jail. So now the kid is hating me, and I don't even know the kid. <laughs> but he grows up with a distrust. Uh, of law enforcement. And the fact of the matter is, we need ethical people um, in police officers to serve in, in, in that law. That's a lot of power. You have the power of the big D we call discretion to determine whether somebody goes home or they go to the jail. That's a lot of power. Sometimes people abuse it. But anyway, this big crowd mentality, and I mean, they were saying things. They were threatening me, they were threatening the police officers. Um, and it was a very, very dangerous situation. The reason we did not end up like Ferguson. Um, because after I left, the mayor came down, I went to run the city council meeting, was because, first of all, we were not going to be afraid of our vote. Now, somebody put their hands on me, it would have been a little something different. Mm -hmm. But, for the, for the most part, people had the right to be outraged. And what we promised them was, let us turn this over to the GBI, which we did. Let them do an independent investigation, which they did. And then, when the facts come out, let them fall where they may. But everybody hates the police until you need the police. 
Did all of a sudden we want to call the police? You know what happened? They all I hate the police, F the police, and all of the rap lyrics and all this kind of stuff. You know, the other day, you know, Mike Epps was on the stage on Friday. He was here in Savannah. Didn't y'all go? Mike Epps, the comedian. Mike Epps, some more. Bruce Bruce were all here, and he was sitting on the stage talking about it. You know, all this stuff about the police. He said, "You see the police? He just lays down." Put his hands out. See my hands? And people thought it was funny, but the fact of the matter was, he wanted eight police officers to walk him into the building. <laughs> eight. So, so I, I guess for, for us as policymakers, um, you know, we have to insist on, on folks being right. But uh, in our state, unfortunately, um, now where you can carry guns everywhere, and now when I was growing up, you had guns that looked like play guns. I mean, you know, it looked like a play gun. Now you can't tell. And you have officers that in the end want to go home to the end of the day. Now, the work that they do, the decisions they have to make in a split second based on what they see, based on their training, can now be taken by juries and dragged out to the, the millisecond of a frame. Um, and so I think that people need to be able to understand what that is. So we have uh, folks in the military, uh, they come home and say thank you for your service because they were involved in, in wars across the world, but yet we have folks here that are involved in urban wars. Um, folks here that had um, guns pulled out on you. And I'll tell you by, by far, our statistics show, as though we have uh, situations that have happened, most police officers, most of the time, overwhelmingly act correctly. They act correctly, they act appropriately. And then we have those that either get scared or they freak out and become intimidated, and those we have to be able to deal with either by helping them be successful somewhere else or by training. Them. Thank you.
process of, of understanding this. Um, as a new paradigm shift of the 70s, everybody wanted to come on board with this notion of neighborhood policing, community-oriented policing, a new approach that would involve the community. And it became a buzzword, <coughs> it, it became fashionable to say that we have <coughs> implemented community-oriented policing into our neighborhoods. And the truth is, uh, community-oriented policing, as uh, the mayor indicated, is not a program. It's a way of thinking. It is a value system. It's a philosophy that we must embrace in everything that we do, not only from the police side, but from the community side. And when we do that, we can not only address the so-called crook-catching tactics or crime control tactics, we also can address livability factors and how our communities will aspire and grow. So we talk about the role of each of these entities, what officers are supposed to do, what police management and leadership are supposed to do, and we talk about, and we'll talk about a little bit, what the community is expected to do. So there are some common features I want to talk about first, and then we'll move to another area. But when we think about community-oriented policing, again, we are going beyond the crook-catching, crime control, old model of policing that I did 40 years ago. I'm sorry, 20 years ago. <laughs> uh, and police departments really have not changed that much in many ways. And they change drastically in other ways. But let's look at what police officers do. Only about 10 to 20 percent of a police officer's time is really about catching crooks. And we've got to shift that 80 percent of time to doing other things, to make the community safe, to make the community viable, to be involved with social, economic activities in the community. And we need to move the police officers themselves from looking at the police uh, due to the responsibility as just a job, a nine to five job. It is more than that. We've got to involve citizens. There has to be an organized approach, an understanding, an effort to reach out to our communities and bring citizens into the policy areas. See, when this first started, uh, the community policing model first was implemented in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, it was about putting people uh, from the pluralistic community uh, in community-oriented policing slots. In other words, important people. But the community-oriented policing model will only work if it's everyday average citizens who share a stake in the safety as an outcome of our communities. And so we got to understand that it is more than just a, uh, an opportunity for retired citizens, college students, and volunteers. It is an opportunity for people of, of substance to, to participate. And we've got to reach out to the citizens. Police commanders and police and law enforcement people got to take on the role of recruitment. That means that they've got to go to the PTA meeting the business association meetings, the civic meetings, to college and universities, to avail officers to become a part of college and university organizations to share information. We were blessed and, and, and really privileged to have Chief Lumpkin here a couple of uh, weeks ago, came in and talked to one of our student groups. And one of the things he said that that's what he does as a senior, as a leader of the Savannah Chatham County Police Department. He's recruiting all the time because he needs to hear from folk like you as young people, <coughs> as quote unquote victims or mis of police misconduct, or even the perceptions that exist. And I'll talk about those in a minute when we come to some perceptions. But the police department has the responsibility to educate the public and share with them what needs to be done. Uh, the 
community oriented policing model is geared on a long term assignment for the officers. When this concept first came out, I was a young police officer and it was met with a lot of resistance because the belief was that it was a babysitting type of responsibility or officers were doing social work. No offense to my social work students because I see some of you all here, but it was believed that this was a soft side of policing and everyone knew that you couldn't control the mean streets of any city in this country by using soft tactics. But that was not true. It was an opportunity to bring the soft tactics in with the, the hardcore areas of policing and to use that as uh, Commissioner Johnson indicated is that this is something that should be done every day. If you officers get to know the community and build liaisons in the community, then people will share information. So it really is not soft. It's an opportunity to solve more crimes. My days on the street as a police officer, you know, it does not, and I can tell you probably, officer, he can tell you also, that uh, we cannot be uh, tough all the time. That we've got to come to a uh, position where we are working together for the sake of the community. And then we can address many of these perceptions, many of the problems. So I will leave that with you for thought. I think we will have a time and opportunity to come back and talk a little bit more about uh, some of the things and, uh, and some of the perceptions because they drive a lot of what police department respond to. Thank you. Thank you. this speaker, you will have an opportunity to ask questions and give comments. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm going to take a slightly different version of uh, shooting. African American males, in fact, there's a paper in which they started on maybe about six months ago. I submitted it, started out with that racial profile, and then got it back from the editor. They say make these corrections and then I'll send it back and then have it published for the for the uh, for the fall. But I changed the structure from that racial profile. And because I think it is um, and the paper now is entitled uh, in fact uh, it, I'm one of the authors, Dr. Wilson, Professor Harris and Dr. Jordan also, they are co authors. But in fact it is called structural discrimination as a causal factor in the arrest, the use of force, and deadly force against African Americans. Okay? Uh, the, these authors assert that uh, race, racial profiling, and police discretion to stop, to arrest, use of force, and deadly force against people of color, especially African American males, is embedded into society custom, norms, practices, policies and laws. Um, in fact, uh, African American males' lives is viewed as not highly valued in terms of ranking seriousness of, of, of uh, death. The what ranks first is that of black killing a white. What ranks last is that of white killing a black. So what what I'm what we're arguing here is that it sometimes it seems as though that policies are designed to help people, but in but in fact it, it starts targeting certain segments of the population, and it's primarily that of minorities, and particularly that of African Americans. It's similar to that of the, the war on drugs. They targeted blacks in the projects. So I'm saying again, it is the policies and practices. It's in the norms. It it is. It is widespread in the fabric of, of American society. So structural, uh, structural discrimination is used as, a, as, a, as an, uh, to explain police behavior in the arrest, use of force, and use of deadly force against people of color, again, especially African American males. Structural discrimination is subtle, it's less obvious, and more indirect in application, although a considerable amount of discrimination uh, tend to be unintended structural discrimination 
is culturally transmitted from generation to generation, especially as it relates to race. Because the issue of race is entrenched in custom laws and practice, discriminatory practices, to patterns and practices are likely to, ex to exist in the area of banking, criminal justice, employment, education, uh, health care, housing, and many other areas in private and in public. Okay, and so it, it is widespread. So go on and try to reduce this down to go over here. In fact, uh, to support my position in terms of uh, structural di discrimination, Director uh, of the FBI, James D. Connolly, uh, noted recently, he, he noted how people use race unconsciously in making decisions. He stated that many people in our white majority culture have unconsciously uh, racial biases and react differently to a white face than a black face. In fact, he calls, he's entitled his, his paper, Hard Truths, and called for open discussion. And he did this in February, uh, February 12, 2015. Say many individuals who believe they have positive attitudes about racial minorities harbor unconscious racial prejudice. They harbor it. In fact, uh, to amplify this racial this racial unconsciousness, uh, spoken by the director, prejudice and stereotypes again are culturally transmitted at an early age. In a study that was conducted by CNN, and they used uh, Professor Margaret Hale from, from uh, Chicago University, who was one of the leading authors in child development. In fact, they, they showed uh, kids who were age five to 10 years, 10 years old a series of questions. And the researchers found that white children as a whole responded with high rate of what researchers call white bias, identifying the color of their skin with positive attributes and dark, darker skin with negative attributes. In fact, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Margaret Spencer noted, uh, she noted that black children as a whole, they had some biases towards whiteness, but far less than whites. And whites uh, really, excuse me, what's really significant is that white children are learning or maintaining those stereotypes uh, much more longer than African American children. Uh, Spencer concluded that we're still living in a society where dark things are devalued and white things are valued, in, in terms of her, uh, what she had concluded. But in regards to uh, police officers shooting and killing black males, whenever race guides, whenever race guides the operation of any social institution to the disadvantage of a minority, it is discrimination. For instance, white police officers use deadly force on alleged African-American uh, male criminal, criminal suspect to demonstrate the belief that black lives are not highly valued. Donald Black uh, lamented that, that black lives are not highly valued in society. Donald Black noted that when, when people offend social superior or inferior, different patterns emerge. Those excused of offending persons above them in social status, quote, whites are likely to be handled severely than those accused of offending uh, somehow uh, people below them, that is, quote, blacks. Those uh, victimized of whites inhabit legal space all their own with the risk of severity greater than anyone's. For example, when a black is convicted of killing a superior, that is a white, the risk of capital punishment leaped far beyond any other racial combination. In Ohio, capital punishment is nearly 15 times higher than that when blacks is convicted of killing a fellow black. In Georgia, the likelihood of such is 30 times higher. In Florida, nearly 40 times higher. Uh, what I'm illustrating here, so when a white is convicted of killing a black, for example, the risk of capital punishment is zero. So what I'm basically arguing in this paper is that racism and discrimination is built into the systems. And somehow that somehow we have to resolve other elements than that of the police force in terms of turning the system around. So other than that, thank you. Thank you.
think when you left, he was in the cabin. That's right. Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> that, that is Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. It, it is indeed an honor and a pleasure to be here. This is home. Uh, I've lived here my entire life, and I love to travel, but there is no place like home. Uh, I've been a police officer now for almost 29 years. I was a civilian dispatcher for the former Savannah Police Department two years before that, and this is a wonderful place to live. Uh, this is a wonderful place to go to school. I teach part-time over at Armstrong as an adjunct professor there as well as over at South University. And so I promise we'll be out of here in the next two hours, okay? <laughs> now, I, I wanted to talk to you a, a little bit about the reality of law enforcement in our community and around this country from, from an old white guy's perspective. How about that? No. Because I got to tell you, I, I make light of that. But with all due respect to race and culture, we don't see each other in law enforcement as black or white or male or female or homosexual or heterosexual. Or, we don't see each other like that. We're, we're blue or we're brown. When we see our community, we are not in the mindset, most law enforcement officers are not in the mindset, oh, I'm going to a black neighborhood. Well, I'm going over to this white neighborhood. You know, and if I say Ardsley Park, what do you think? Well, that's a white neighborhood. No, it's not a white neighborhood. It's a particular geographic area. And so if I say Collar Brownsville, what do you say? Culturally, historically, it is. But it's a location. Collar Brownsville is a designation on our map. It is a particular neighborhood where real people live, and there are real issues in place there. And so I'm not defending anything that police officers around the country do, and I'm not even going to stand up here and try to defend what the Savannah Chatham Metropolitan Police Department does, or really even what I do. I'm going to tell you what the perception of reality is in law enforcement today, particularly in our community. So we know that the negative effects of current policing strategies far outweigh the public safety benefits. Do you agree with that? What we're doing today just doesn't seem to be working. Okay, so we spend more money on policing. We spend more money on punitive measures. The laws are voted upon by the council, the commission, the state legislature, our federal government. We the people decide what those laws will be and we vote those laws, we vote those legislators into place who will make those laws because we say this is what we want. If it's a loud stereo, I love my music loud. I just hope that my windows are up and you can't hear it, right? But I like my music loud too, but guess what? There's a city ordinance that prohibits a sound outside of your car, outside of your home or outside of your car. If we can hear it, it is a violation of a city ordinance. It's also a violation of a state law. That means that our city council voted to enact that ordinance. That means that our state legislator voted to enact that law. So police officers are charged with the responsibility of law enforcement, not prejudicially, not selectively, although it is quite selective. There's this matter of discretion. And so when we enforce domestic violence uh, and assault. It's not because we want to take someone to jail or not. It's because the law says if we can identify the primary offender, we are to make an arrest. You think about, think about railroad tracks. And those are the tracks of common decency that we all strive to stay along those tracks. We all want to do what's right. We want to, all want to do what's best. You're here for an education. You're here to hear this presentation today. When you go out here today, your intent is most likely not to commit a robbery. Your intent is most not likely not to break the law. But sometimes we fall off of those tracks. Sometimes we get stopped for having a loud stereo in our car. Sometimes we get stopped because, th just this morning, there was an armed robbery on the side, uh, over on White Bluff Road. And uh, two guys were seen, uh, took off running. Guess what? They were not the suspects. 
Why did they take off running? Because the police were chasing them. That can't be good, right? Well, we bring the folks back and the witnesses say that's not them. So then we let them go. But what if it had been them? Uh, so we try to stay along the tracks of common decency. If we arrest you, if we write you a citation, if we give you a warning, it's not a violation of Larry's law, it's not contempt of cop. It's because there's a specific violation, a specific law, a specific ordinance that says you can't do that. Because we the people have said you can't do that. We try to get you back on those tracks. In the, in the case of domestic violence that I use, we don't arrest people to punish them. If we can get them into a court system that's going to provide those services that will help them not to beat their spouse physically or, or uh, verbally, then that's a good thing. If we can keep that family unit together, that's a good thing. So um, I, I just I, I, want, I know some of the things that we that we are doing in regard to human policing may not may not quite be uh, <coughs> on the right track. Uh, contributing to the number of people we put in jail and in prison is part of what we are charged to do. Again, not to punish, but because of violation of law. But that creates a distrust in police. We're seen as the man, the, the bad guy. Um, you know, and I sure wish it could be different. I sure wish I didn't have to wear a gun. Since I started this job, I said, and Larry is sitting over here with Savannah State University Police, he and I have had this conversation. I'm sure I know we used to always talk about it. I wish I didn't have to carry this gun. I carry this gun to protect you, and to protect me, and to protect my partner. Because if anything happens to me, then my partner's got to take care of it. And if anything happens to you, then who's charged with, with protecting you? The police are. That, that phrase that we talked about earlier, to serve and protect, you know where that comes from? The service part is to think for others, to help others when they cannot help themselves, when they cannot think for themselves, and that's victims, that's witnesses, and it's people suspected of committing a crime. That means we treat you fairly and impartially and just until you can get into that system so that you'll be okay. Now, when we say protect, who do we protect? It was mentioned earlier. Honestly and truly, I'm going to protect myself because I want to go home at night. If I lay down and die, that's no hero stuff. That's part of why we wear this badge. We don't sign up to die. I've got a wife. I've got five beautiful children, four of which are still here, one went home. But I've got I've got children, I've got a wife, I've got a family who love me. I don't I don't think about dying. But you know what? It's a very real possibility. But I'm gonna take care of myself and then I'm gonna take care of my partner who's out there working with me, because again, if one of us go down, then we gotta handle it by ourselves. But it's not ranked in any order, because I'm also protecting you. That's why I have to have a gun and a uh, uh, baton and OC spray and a taser and a bullet resistant vest and all the tools of urban war that we talked about. Um, but what we're doing right now may not be the best practice. Jail has ne negative effects for people, for families, and for communities. But I, I want to talk about positive investments in our community as police officers that promote public safety. This idea as this idea as a community-oriented policing philosophy, we started this in the 90s here in, in Savannah. There is so much more, I, I've gotten notes. See, most of my classes, we were talking earlier, most of my classes are three hours and 40 minutes long or one south. I want to come back and talk with you. I'll come back, uh, teachers, I'll come back to your classes and, and I'll spend the whole class with you if you'll let me. I, I, I'm very proud of, of what the Savannah Chatham Metropolitan Police Department has accomplished. And, and I want to tell you, our chief talks about it. I'm sure he talked about it when he was here most recently. And I'm going to tell you, I, I'm, I'm a community man. And I'm a company man. Uh, I, I've got, as I said, nearly 30 years experience with our department. I believe in what we're doing, and if you've been if you've been wrong, if you if you have a gripe, we want to hear it. I want to hear it. Uh, Dr. Johnson has my contact information. Van Johnson has my information. Larry over there has my information. 
Most of you, uh, where's Ann Royce? Is she still here? Does she have to leave? Uh, Ann Royce and I have been friends for many, many years. She's got my contact information. I'll leave it with anybody who wants it. I want to talk to you. I want to be completely open and transparent about what our law enforcement agency is doing for our community. So thank you. I, I know we've, we've run over a little bit, but Dr. Johnson, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you all. I want to first thank you for staying, and now this is your opportunity to engage these panelists. But I'd like to make uh, one statement before we, we get into the question and answer. I put up on the screen a negative section of the relationship between the black community and the police force. I also put up what would be a positive <coughs> relationship between the police and the community. Uh, it is up to us as citizens to make sure that that positive relationship happens. If we do not talk to our elected representatives who are making the laws that they must enforce, if we aren't working in our community to control the hoodlum and the thugs, then you know what we're going to do. We're going to call on these folk to protect us from the hoodlums and the thugs. And then when some of them go overboard and go beyond what we expect, then we're outraged and incensed. And then we want to kill the cops you know, until the next time we need, like Ben Johnson said. So I want you to keep that in mind because it is so easy to let our emotions take over. And when emotions <coughs> take over, we do irrational things. And when we do irrational things, there is sometimes a tremendous cost to that action. It could be your life. So we will have other opportunities to discuss our views about why is it in our community that violence against each other is acceptable, but violence against other people, we're a little more reticent to engage in that because we know the penalty is going to be different. So why should I devalue you and give more respect to somebody else who does the same thing? We have an example of two Kmart situations. One ended up with a person being killed. Another ended up with a person going to jail. Now we have to unpack all of that and find out why did the black person get killed and why did the white person go to jail? But it's that kind of dialogue that we must have on a university campus like this. The academic world is supposed to seek the truth, to engage in honest dialogue, to put it all on the table, good and bad, and then help you become the kind of citizens that can make this world better. So I promise you that the with the approval of our Dean of, of, of Library Services, that we will have other opportunities for you to come and get into some of the nitty gritty. Because you folks are living. You're living. And unfortunately, I'm no less likely to encounter what you encounter if I'm not known. And when you have, like this young man said, the dress doesn't matter. It's the color that sets up a whole dynamic that brings upon certain actions and reactions. And so we, we've got to talk about that. All right, questions and comments. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I have this question for you first, and I'd like you to answer the same question to the Question for me? Oh, no, no, for um, please. For the Yeah, I forgot to. Van Johnson. Van Johnson. Uh, first, 
I have one question on both of you guys. Coming from a white police officer's point of view, since I've never had the opportunity to ask, why do you feel as if the uh, incarceration rate for black males is higher than any other racial group in the United States? So I'd like you to ask the first thing, you give your input on that. Yes, thank you, thank you. Did everybody, everybody heard the question? What, why is the incarcerate, incarceration rate greater for African American males in the United States uh, than, than any other? Well, you know, it depends upon the neighborhood we're working in. It depends upon, in, in, in other words, if it's a largely African American population like Tyler Brownsville, we use for the example. Um, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I can tell you that. We don't have a quota, we don't have a criteria, there's nothing that we ever receive in training. Matter of fact, I brought 16 hours of tactical communications training to this police department. I didn't create it, but it's a, it's a nationally known, you can look it up online, verbaljudo.com, it's a tactical communications training. Um, and our officers are taught to treat everyone with respect and with dignity, and again, there's, there's really only three types of people, and, and this is not a trade secret. You can go online at www.verbaljudo.com and see this. And see this. It's, it's not, it doesn't matter if you're black, white, Asian, male, female. As I said, there's three types of people in this world, and, and we would never tell you that to your face. But there's nice people. Those are the people who would do exactly what you tell them to do based upon your legitimate authority in this badge. You see, we have laws and we have rules that we must follow. We have to follow the same laws that you have to follow. If I whacked you over the head with a nightstick, that's aggravated assault. We're not trained to do that. I'm, I'm liable for uh, criminal prosecution. I'm also liable for uh, civil sanction. You can sue me. And I'm also liable under violation of our department policies. So there's nice people, people like my mom and dad, like many of you, if the police tell you to do something based upon our authority, you're going to do it. Second of all, there's difficult people, and that's not bad people, that's people who want to ask why. How many of you have children? Have they ever asked why? Why do I have to do that? Well, we, we understand that is a natural response from people, not just children, but from people. When we tell someone to do something based upon our legitimate authority, to ask why is not a not a threat to us. We teach our officers explain to people why, because that's there's actually a five-step process that we go through. But those are difficult people. People who dare to challenge the way of thinking, the way I'm thinking, or the way we think. So there are difficult people. But again, they're not bad people. You better not turn your back on them because they might hurt you, though. you got to watch out. And then there's those sneaky people. Those are the people that are smiling to your face and yes, sir, no, sir, and they're going to file a complaint before you can get off the end of your ship. And really, that's, that's, that's the only three people that we are looking at. It, if, if you're, if you're African-American, if you're Asian, if you're Hispanic, it's just if there's a violation of law, then it is our responsibility to enforce that law. So, uh, you believe it's entirely coincidental that I'm sorry. I said you believe it's coincidental that this happens, or you believe it's just by chance <coughs> that incarceration is higher just because we're uh, we're the ones breaking the law at a higher rate than the cop, or you just like you said, you believe it's just all coincidental. No, it's not a coincidence. We need that. Let me let me answer. Let me answer the question from my perspective. Now, I'll say um, the opinions expressed are my own and uh, not reflective of the city of Savannah or anybody I work for or will work for in the future. Um, I think that there is a, um, we inherited a, a, a systematic racism, structural racism, um, that, is, that is against not only people of color, but poor people. And I mean, and, and people of all races, people of goodwill will tell you that. I mean, if you look at where, if you just look at the data, see where the data drops. Even in Chatham County, we have, we're approximately about over six, about 60% um, actually white population. However, 70% of the population in the jail have to be African Americans. I mean, it's some, why is that? Why is that the statistics say that, that everybody uses drugs and buy and sell drugs at about the same rate? However, 
you know, when you look at the incarceration rates uh, of African Americans, they're high. Um, again, I don't think it's something that that, that we <coughs> created anybody in this room. But I do think that it's structural, and I think that is something that we have to work around. I don't think it's a coincidence at all. Um, we are in a jail economy. Um, a lot of people make a lot of money off of jails being built. They make a lot of money um, off of programs in jails um, that they are able to understand from the third grade to be able to tell a young person, we know if you fail in the third grade, when you get 17, we're going to have a jail ready for you. Now the question is, we don't have to be going into jails. But the fact is, I just think that's that's the, that's the where we are right now. And I think that one day we'll have to really look at uh, Dr. Johnson. Um, why, why is it? Why is it like that? I'm going to answer your question. How, how many of you would come to a session like this? It'll have to be two hours. It can't be done in an hour. <laughs> on, on the... Um, Political, economic structure of criminality in the black community. Right. Then that's going to be our next topic because we need to talk about race and class intersects, and there's a political dynamic to it, and there's an economic dynamic. 20 or 30 years ago, counties in Georgia would fight you if you talked about putting a prison in their county. Now, they are like lobbying you <laughs> to have prisons and jails built in their county because there's an economic factor to that. And if you build a jail, you're going to fill the jail. It's simple as that. So, if y'all will come, we'll set it up, and we'll have a little more in-depth, because there is personal responsibility, and then there's institutional and structural responsibility. A lot of us know what the rules are, but we choose not to follow the rules. There's a consequence to that, and there's a price to pay for that. But at the same time, there is a cultural and environmental set of issues, especially around poverty, that push some people toward criminality. If I can't get a job, and the drug dealer says, hey, you can make $1,000 a week, that's a hell of a lot of temptation for me. <laughs> but then when you start disaggregating the whole drug economy, oh, Lord, that's a deep conversation. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, in the blue, y'all help me. And I'll, I'll start the editorial line. Because we're going to have the session, right? Yeah. All right. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, well, I'm going to paint a scenario first before I ask my questions. All right. So, me growing up, this is not written, by the way. I'm just painting this scenario. All right. So, me growing up, I'm a little, I'm a little um, boy at the time. And my mom and dad tells me, before I'm even able to be around society, my mom and dad tells me, well, you know, dogs, they're bad. They're bad things. They're, they're, they'll kill you. They're dangerous. And you should, stay, or you should stay away from them. So me growing up having that mentality, I'm going outside, finally, into society. Now I'm seeing all these dogs coming around me. I'm scared. So what I do is I'm killing every single dog that's coming around me. Because I don't know if the dog is good or bad if it's coming around. So my question is, um, just as um, you said, as African American communities, we're growing up pretty much saying, um, hearing in our ear that police are bad, they're, they're not trustworthy, they're out to hurt you. I'm believing that there's, there's another picture of the police officers who aren't African American. They're growing up in the in the community of, of where their parents is telling them, well, you know, there's African Americans, they're out here, they're dangerous, they're bad. So my thing is, if the <coughs> policing or the law enforcement who are not um, grown around African Americans, haven't went to school, haven't played a game of tic-tac-toe with them, haven't even, you know, when they're out as adults, they still have the same mindsets and the same values that their parents taught them. So now the dance society around all these people who are different from them, 
my question is, what is the line of protection? Because you said that protect and to serve. So my thing is, my question is, where does that line draw itself when it comes to protecting and serving? And that's the thing. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, the, the statistics really show police officers acting pretty much the same because of training and so forth. There are some differences as to how they react, but the psychology of reaction and the stresses involved, I think, drives that decision more so than what sometimes they get information they get at home. For instance, um, you know, um, there are plenty of studies that have shown that police officers who might work a 12 to 8 shift, morning shift, they come to work, they might have to go to court, they are not getting enough sleep, they are, because of the, the job they do, they are, per, they are perceived to, uh, they're tired. They see a system that's turning folk out as it revolves. They see um, uh, family torn apart. They see conditions that normal people don't see, and to the extent that in many cases been classified as PTSD. And sometimes those individuals, uh, race not uh, being a factor, uh, will respond in such a way that it is illogical, and it does not have to be race involved. For instance, we look at the Eric Garner case, that was uh, an African American woman involved. Uh, many African American officers stood on the line in Ferguson. Many African American officers are employed around the country. I think that it's something that the, uh, the major said a minute ago. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's the bond, it's the blue uniform, oftentimes where police officers see themselves. And you probably get the same response from both, even though you know it was raised in a household that um, taught you to respond to or be aware of certain dangers. I think that it's the, basically it's the role of the police, the fact that the uniform itself garners a certain amount of authority. And there are people from children who have issues with, the, with authority. And sometimes the police officer become that individual who uh, people can hang their frustration and their resentment on. So it's not all the time a race thing. I think sometimes it's a professional thing. I just want to make a quote right here in regards to arresting and possibly addressing uh, the question in terms of of why there's so many African Americans in prison. It says, an overview of studies on race and criminal justice process concluded that most studies reveal what police officers freely admit that race is independently significant if not the determining factor in deciding whom to follow, search, or arrest. Can you address how fear might play a role in how officers might be responding to um, volatile situations? I'm sorry, could you repeat that now? How does fear play a factor in responding to volatile situations? Well, um, you know, certainly we're not fearless. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, if if someone started shooting in that library, uh, most of you would be coming this way. Uh, it is my responsibility to notify my backup what we've got and for me to go that way. So whether perhaps we respond out of fear, we react out of fear being a variable, I think that uh, perhaps if we feel physically threatened or if you feel physically threatened, we're going to escalate to a level one step above the threat. So if someone has a stick, well, we're not going to take out our nightstick. We're not going to go to one step you know, equal. We're going to go to the next step. If someone comes at you with fists and starts beating you, then rather than stand there and go toe to toe, because typically, typically when we talk about our verbal judo training, I'll take the biggest person in the room and I'll have them stand up here and, I, and in front of class I'll say, okay, what I want you to do is hit me as hard as you can. Well, I don't want to get hit as hard as I can. 
can be hit. But I also don't want to stand there and go toe to toe with someone either fighting or verbally. So we take that to the next step. Do we, are we afraid? I, I'm afraid when I'm laying in bed and hear something go bump in my house I've been in for 27 years. But whether or not it plays a factor and if we're more aggressive or more violent towards someone, I, I think it's based, it's dependent on the individual. And, and I'm gonna have to leave, I'm gonna stand, um, but I, I, I like this, I need to go back. But um, have any of you ever been in a life or death situation where you just did not know to the next second whether you were going to live or die? Yeah. Yeah. Well, think about this. Well, I mean, if that's your situation, but I mean, I, when you've been in that type of situation, you can train all day long. But if somebody legitimately feels that they're in danger or they feel that they're being, I mean, sometimes people overreact. They, they overreact, the training goes out of the window, and they will overcompensate, which is why when you look at court, people are saying, well, at this point, what did you see? What did you think? How did you feel at that point? And so I think that is a fear, I think, plays a very big part in it because, I mean, law enforcement always, always tell you that it's easy to be judged by six and carried by, what? Judged by 12 and carried by six? I mean, and if any of y'all in that situation, look, if it's gonna be me or them, who's it gonna be? I'm out, do something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got one, two, three, five questions, and then we're going to have to close. But I promised you, and I try to be a man of my word, that we will have another opportunity to get into this in a different way than we have approached this today. Uh, who wants to? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to get everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Thank you, sir. My question is, how recommend you going to be part of the actual situation that require additional training, specifically of the policy that you have been successful in the hospital? Thank you very much. We've been trying to get that down to the facility society and how they do it. Yeah, that is an excellent question. I'm not sure if everyone heard it. How, how quickly do we respond when we realize that we need to improve our situation? How do we address that training? How quickly do we respond to that? And we are very keen to that. I'm one of those decision makers, uh, the, the majors, the assistant chief, the chief. Uh, but we depend upon those officers that are in the department to, to provide that kind of feedback. And we depend upon you, the community, to provide that kind of feedback to us. That's one of the reasons we, we offered the tactical communications training, because our biggest complaint overall, historically, is I don't like the way that officer talked to me. We learned a lot from uh, the officer involved shooting where the, where the gentleman died. Uh, we learned a lot out of Ferguson. We learned a lot out of um, every situation. We try to take away learning points and we look at best practices. Uh, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, the Police Executive Research Forum, the Georgia Association of Chiefs of Police, there's so many professional standards. We are nationally accredited uh, under the Commission for Accreditation of Law Enforcement, CALEA, and we strive to meet those standards. From a practical standpoint, if there's something that we need to be doing better, in other words, we look to best practices, we also look to our community to give us that feedback as to what we ought to be doing better. That was a great question. Thank you. Yeah, it was. Uh, yes, sir. You know, I hear a lot of people saying uh, about problems. Well, I grew up in Savannah in the 40s, the 40s and 50s, and we had two police officers down there. We had a county police that lived on President, I mean on East Florida and Perry. We had a city police that lived on Wheaton Street. And the thing that I remember most about that is in 1947 when they got, well, the colored policemen. He was stationed down there. So at that point, they had three police officers. Are you talking about from East Broad to McAllister, President, the Wheaton, and that block. And they had a lot of young black men. But my collection is that Mr. County, Dr. Prince Jackson Daddy, used to walk that neighborhood. And he would tell us individually, if you go to jail for stealing, raping, or whatever, whatever you, what's your daddy name? 
Your name will not be that no more. We will disown you for the rest of your life. You know, and that put fear in a lot of us. And, you know, they said, well, you was poor. My mother took a Christmas club for 50 years. She put money in the bank, and we never had to borrow no money for Christmas. But these young people now, they getting the income tax in December. <laughs> you know, my, I ain't never heard of such things. They don't believe in personal sacrifice. It's, it's, it's a mentality that we got away from. And I know there's a lot of single mothers. I, in my class, we had 40 kids. 39 of us was in the same class with our mother and father. Everybody in that class at Harris Street School lived with their mother and father. Only one person, that was Rudolph, his father got killed in a, in a track accident or something. So, you know, you got all these kids, all these people now, they get, and the first thing they say, well, my, are we poor? I ain't never heard people poor getting food stamps. How you gonna be poor? And I'm working, I gotta buy my food. You getting your food free, you can't be poor. We, we, that, that, that's a class, that's a class issue. And we, we have got to have an honest discussion about class in the black it's community. True. I grew up poor too. And a whole lot of people in my generation, we didn't know anything about a lot of this stuff that's going on now that needs to be used as excuses for bad behavior. And we have to talk about that. And we got to be honest.